Okay, good afternoon. Let's get started with today's lecture. And as I mentioned in the email, I will be uh, simulcasting this lecture for those of you who are at home. Um, you'll be watching, uh, we'll be listening to some of the interaction, but the, the screen was gonna be showing the slides. Uh, so the last thing that we did on Wednesday, actually on Wednesday, we talk about three different things. Uh, we talk about product design, process design, and schedule design. And we stopped after discussing this problem in which we were calculating the production requirements for a serial process with three operations. Uh, the idea was to compute the initial or the input at the beginning of the process uh, by taking into consideration the different um, defect rates for each one of the machines and also the sequence in terms of the, uh, where the parts needed to go in the process. Uh, so, I ask you to review this. I ask you to look at uh, the problem because today we're going to have our first lab. In, in this lab, you're going to uh, work by yourself. You're going to try to solve this problem. And I want you to get scared. We're going to discuss the problem in class, but I want you to at least think about it and attempt to, to solve it by yourself. Um, so let's get started with that. You can just Take a piece of paper. If you don't have paper with you, I can provide you with a piece of paper. And the idea is that after we discuss a problem, we you can upload the solution to Canvas uh, by tonight. So you, if you're at home, you can uh, you can also upload the the solution. So what you're gonna do is just take a picture or scan that piece of paper that you're working on right now and upload that into the link for lab number one in Canvas. Okay, so the problem says the following, and let me help you set up the, at least the sequence of machines. So you have three different parts. So in the problem that we discussed on Wednesday, we have only one part, one part type. In this one, we're gonna have three. So we have part type A, part type B, and part type C. And the idea, and at least what the question is trying to, to ask you, what you need to find is how many of each part type do you need to get the output that is required for this process? Um, so we start by looking at part A, is produced on machine one and then it has to go, go to machine number two. And one unit of part A is assembled with three units of part B. So right there, you have a connection. So the machine one and machine two. And then you have process here that goes to Machine two, and this is part type A. So one unit of part type A is assembled with three units of part B, which is produced on machine three. So we have separate machine, I'm gonna call it M3. And this guy is going to, sorry. Um, it's not going to go to C. 
So we're gonna have a sub assembly happening here. And you need three parts from this guy and you need one part from this guy. So you have B here. And the assembly is gonna happen in station four. So this is station four. Um, machine one has a scrap factor of 25%. So you're losing 25% here. And machine two has a scrap, a scrap factor of 20%. The assembly process has a scrap factor of 10%. So well, let me use the same notation, right? So I'm using point 10. And then he says that the assembly process has a scrap factor of 10%. And then another part, part C is produced on machine five. So another machine M5, and this is part C and has a scrap estimate of 35%. Part C and the subassembly comparison of part A and part B as L assemble at station six. So we have another station in which we are going to uh, connect. These two. And then 35% part C and the sum assembly part A and part B are assembled at a station six in, into the complex product. Each day 30,000 units of the completed product are required to meet the demand. Assuming that machine three and assembly station six have a scrap factors of 20%. So this one is 20% and this is also 20%. We want to know, we need 30,000 at the end. How many we need to start with for A? How many we need to start with for B? And how many we need to start with for C? So that's the question. Okay, so I'll let you try to work on that based on our discussion. And then we are going to um, solve it together. See how that goes. Um, the most you try to solve it, the farther you go solving this problem, the better you will get prepared for the first exam because you will see something like this in the exam for sure. So the major difference between this one and the one that we discussed in the previous lecture was that you only have one part type and you didn't have those other two components coming into the process. You didn't have part B and part C. Um, but you can still solve for A. You don't need to take into account B and C to solve for A. So it will be solved in the same way you solved the previous example. The, the novelty of this problem comes when you try to find B and C, how many you need for B and C.
And also don't forget that one unit of part A is assembled with three units of part B. So you need three, three parts B to assemble with one part A. Uh, the last one. The last? Huh. Yeah. So it's this. Let me let me fix that. Okay. Okay, thank you. So it looks like the the lab is locked. I mean the submission. The file. Okay. But you will see. I mean, it's the same thing that we have here. So it's not going to change it's the same uh, information. So what I will do is at the end of the lecture, I will uh, make it uh, available. So you don't need that for now. But thank you for letting me know. So the things that I mark in, in blue are the ones that you know. 06, calling all 06 because it's the output for six. And then you have D1, D2, D3, up to D6. And then using that information, you can work backwards to get the, the input for each one of the stations. 
uh, until you get to the input for A, the input for B, and the input for C. Okay, so we're going to start the discussion in two minutes. Okay, so going back to the problem. The, the, the only things that we know are the, the output for station six, which is 30,000. And we have also the values for the defective rates for each one of the stations. And what I want to find in this problem are the values for how many parts I need for A in order to get 30,000 units at the end of the of the line, how many I need of type B and how many I need of type C in order to get those 30,000. Um, so I, I have marked the, the unknowns that I want to find in green. So you see, I wanna find I1 because that's the input for A. I wanna find I3 because that's the input for B. And I want to find I5 because that's the input for C. Based on the, the numbers that I use to represent this uh, network. So I'm going to start with I1, because that one, you know, that's similar to this. If you don't take into account the other components, it's going to look just like this one. Okay, so you proceed in the same way. You will get 
your output and then you work backwards, right? So you find I3, I3 becomes output of two. So from there, I can find I2. I put up two becomes uh, the output for one, and then I can find I1. So in that way, I can find that part A, the number of parts that I need for A. So if you remember also that I pointed out in class that if that's the case, if you only have parts in C, uh, machines in sequence and you want to know the input, you can use this equation, which is the, the value for the output in this case, n is going to be 6 in our problem. And then you're going to divide that by the multiplication of 1 minus the defective rates that are applied to, to these uh, sequence of machines. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use this equation okay, to find I1. So I1. is going to be 06 divided by 1 minus d6 multiplied by 1 minus d4 multiplied by 1 minus d2 multiplied by 1 minus d1. So those are stations six, four, two, and one, the ones that are uh, impacting the value of A. 06 I know is 30,000, and I know the values for D1, D2, D4, and D6. So if I substitute those numbers, 30,000 divided by, one minus D6, which is 0.2, times one minus D4, which is 0.1, times one minus D2, which is 0.2, times one minus D1, which is 0.25. And number I got for that, 69,444 times 44. Yes, you would round up, correct. Because you need an integer number. So you go to the next one. Uh, so this would be 69,445. Good question. So that would be for A. So we're done with A. Let's do B. So what do I know? What do I know about B? I know that I need three parts of B or to assemble with A. So I have to take that into account. Um, so whatever we find that has to be multiplied times three. And I also know that, that the input for I4, I need the input of I4 in order to compute this number. So that's what's going in to this station. And it's gonna be I4. And then we also have to take into account the scrap rate for that station. Okay, so I, I have that, but still don't know what I4 is. So I need to find I4. Okay, I know I3 is gonna be three times whatever is going into station four divided by the scrap rate for 
uh, that station. But I don't know I4. I need to find I4. Um, so if we follow the same process that we follow for finding the input for uh, station or machine one, the input for A, we can go backward, look at X6, X4, and so forth, the input of four. All right, same equation. Imagine that your system is just a sequential process with two stations. So if you imagine that, then you can find I4 in the same way. Okay, and I'm, I'm trying to find I4 because that's the only unknown for this equation. The only, the only thing that I don't know to solve for I3 is I4. So I4, I know that I need to find the input for six, and I know I need to find the input for four in order to get that body. Okay, so how do you find I4? In this case, I know O6 divided by the scrap rate for six, one minus that value times one minus the scrap rate for four. So going backward, I know 30,000, I can get I6. I6 is gonna be the same as the output of four. So I get output of four and getting the output of four, I can find the input of four with this equation, okay? So solving this, you get 30,000 divided by one minus 0.2 times one minus 0.1. And this is equal to 41. Thousand six 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 point seven. So for B, this is B. Yes, we're gonna need forty one thousand six hundred and sixty seven. Oh, yes, sorry, <laughs> you're right. Yeah, this is I4. Let me take that back, thank you. Was getting ahead. So we got I4, that's correct. And now we have to plug in that number into the I3 value. This is I4. So we take I4. We take I4. And we substitute that into here. So we get I3 equals three times. 41,666.7 divided by one minus D3 is 0.2. So I3 is going to be equal to 156. 250. Thank you. So this is for B. Yes. By three, good question. So to go to the second sentence, uh, it says that one unit of part A is assembled with three units of part B. So for every unit of A that is coming in this direction, I need three 
coming into the sub-assembly, okay? So we found the value of I3, that has to be multiplied by uh, three. Yes. So every time something goes in, you will lose some parts because they are defective. Okay. Good. Any other question? Okay, so I hope I have enough space here to work with the last piece, uh, which is I5 which is I5 is gonna tell us how many C parts we need. Use another car. So part C, this is part B. And this is part A. Okay, so for part C, we need to find the input of five. So it's the input here, input five, this. We need to find that number. And we can define I5. six so we can find the input of six and then by finding the input of six we can find the uh, how many parts we need coming in from uh, five into the station six so going back to so we need the, the output of six to find the input of six we have to divide that by one minus d6 And in order to get the number of parts that we need for I5, we have to divide by one minus D5. So in this case, this will be 30,000. One minus D6, 0.2. One minus 0.35. And this is 57,693. Not work, right? But it's good. It's a good exercise. So you can see different ways that these problems can, can be framed. Um, so now you have two good examples. In the assignment, you will have another problem to solve based on, on this discussion or more practice. And I can tell you right now, you will see something like this in the exam. So, um, so it's important. Yes. Yes, yes. Rather than try to find every single piece of the of the network. Yes. So I'm I'm breaking them up into series, right? So I got the top one and then I got the second one and then the third one. Yes. Any other question? Good. So remember for you to get the credit of Complete that exercise on your own, take a picture, upload that to Canvas by tonight. You have until 11.59 to do that. So I will do it up right after class, take a picture, upload it, and make sure that you submit. Yes.
Okay. So we have one more, oh, an, an, another scenario that I want to discuss. Oh, yes, sorry. For B, I multiply by C because um, the statement says that for uh, one unit of part A is assembled with three units of part B. So every one, every unit of A that is coming into station four, I need three that are part B. Okay, but that's not the case for five. For five, you just need one. For C, you just need one. Okay. Any other question? Good. So, one more scenario is this one. Uh, in this problem, I don't have numbers. I just want you to visualize if you have something like this, how would you go about it? Uh, so, we are going to deal with the unknowns. Okay. So, you know, for in this problem, we have calculations we rework. So, what that means is if you get parts that are, are not good, let's say from station one, these parts are defective. Instead of just throwing them, not using them, you're going to take those to another machine. You're going to try to fix them. And the ones that there will be still some of them that are going to be discarded, but some of them will go back to the process. So instead of losing those parts, you want to know, can I fix some of them and then bring them back to the process? Um, so that's the situation that we want to, to address. Um, and the way that I'm going to uh, try to solve this is I want to find an expression, mathematical equation, that uses the information that is known. to find I want. So what do we know? Say, so for this type of problems, we're gonna know what's the output. Okay, so output of three, I know. I also will know the defective rates for each one of the machines. So we we'll know what are D1, D2, D3, and all three. So my, um, or the information that I know so so I know O3, D1, D2, and D3. I know that information. And I want to find I1. Okay, so that's the only information that I know, and I want to find I1. So I need to build an expression that uses O3, D1, D2, and D3, and get me I1. Okay, so that's the purpose of this exercise. Um, why is that? Because that's the information that I need. I just, I know O3, I know D1, D2, and D3. That's the only thing that I know. The only uh, variables that I know, but still there's plenty of other information that I don't know. So I want to find the, the expression that will give me I with those, with that information. Um, so we can start building this expression as follows. You see, uh, I'm giving you some information already. We know O1 is gonna be 
equal to one minus D one uh, times I one. We know that this flow up right here is gonna be equal to the input of one times the defective rate. We know O2 is gonna be equal to one minus D2 times I2, because you take I2 and you, um, you remove the, the defective rates and what's going into this node is the complement of that. So the parts that are not defective, you find the parts that are not defective multiplying that input times one minus the defective rate and so on. Okay, so I'm going to start by listing some of these equations. So O1 is gonna be equal to one minus D1 times I1, right? The output of one is gonna be the input of one times one minus the defective rate. So if the defective rate is 0.5%, the output of that machine will be the input times 95%. 95% of the parts are gonna be good. So I'm gonna multiply that by the input. Um, so I get O1, I know I2 equals D1 times I1. So um, this is I2, this is what I'm referring to as I2. Is the number of parts that are gonna go to the rework. That's I2. So that's gonna be the, the parts that are defective from one. So it's I1 times Z1. Okay, so I2 is equal to I1 V1. And the output of two, this output right here is gonna be one minus Z2 times I2. Okay, so whatever goes into the machine, input of two, I wanna know what's the output. It is going to be what's in times one minus the defective rate. So if the defective rate is 5%, it's gonna be I2 times 95%. 95% of the parts will go to that node I3. So I have that information, I have those equations. Then I know if you already took um, circuits from electrical engineering, you know that if you two things go into the same node, you can uh, add them. So it's the same, same logic here. So I3 is gonna be the sum of O1 plus O2. So I know I know I3 is gonna be equal to O1 plus O2. And from there, since I already solved for some of these unknown, O1, I have an expression for O1 here. And O2, I have an expression for O2 here. So I'm going to substitute those two into this equation. So O1 equals one minus D1 times I1 plus O2 is one minus D2 times I2. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm I already found I1. I included I1 into my equation, so that's good. That's my the, 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 the unknown that I want to find. I want to find the input. Um, I still need to deal with this guy right here because I don't know that information. So do I have an expression for I2 in terms of D1 and I1? The answer is yes, right? So I2, I have an expression for I2 here that I can substitute into this. I have one minus D1 
I1 plus 1 minus D2 times this expression, D1 I1. So as you can see now, this is I3. I3 equals this. So I now have the expression in terms of I1. And the information that I know from that expression is D1 and D2. So what's still missing is if I were to solve this equation, there's still two unknowns here, I3 and I1. I want to solve for I1. So I still need to find an expression for I3. So let me solve for, let me use this equation and solve for I1. So this will be I3 equals I1 times one minus D1 plus D1 times one minus D2. So I took I1 out of the equation and I'm multiplying times the, the rest. And by doing that, I can solve for I1 now. So I1 is gonna be equal to I3 divided by all this. One minus D1 plus D1 times one minus D2. Okay, so now I get I1 out because I1 is what I want to find. I still have to find an expression for I3. The question is, do I, can I find an expression uh, for I3 with information that I know? The answer is yes. If you go here, you can see that expression right here. Um, I3, equals O3 divided by one minus D3. So in that expression, I know O3 and I know D3. The, that information I know. So you go to this list, right? That information I know, I'm trying to find an expression for I1 that uses only the information that I know. So I know O3, I know D3. So that means that I can substitute this equation into I3. So I can substitute all this into here. And then I will have an expression in terms of all the information that I know for I1. So let's see. So if I do that, I1 is going to be equal to O3 divided by 1 minus D3 times all this. 1 minus D1 plus D1 times minus 1 minus D2. OK? So if you have something like this, the rework uh, station, this is the expression that is going to give you I1, the input that you will need. And the expression is using all the information that is given. You have O3, you have D3, D1, and D2. So all this work to find that expression that can give you the input for one, using the information that we know from the problem. So all that math that you've been taking as part of uh, your undergraduate degree, uh, we are putting that into work here. Okay, so we are solving equations, substituting equations and um, finding the, the unknown. Questions, like if I plug in some numbers, if I give you D1, D2, and D3, and the output of three, then you just go into this expression 
logging in, get the input of one. Okay. Good. So again, you, you will have a, an assignment with, with some problems that you need to solve using this, uh, this material. Um, so I encourage you to go over that and you will see that in your first assignment. So let's get to uh, transition to a different topic uh, in facilities design. Um, so once what will happen, once you get all this information about product process and schedule design. Um, so once the product process and schedule design decisions have been made, the facilities planners needs to organize the information and generate and evaluate uh, layout, the material handling, the storage, and the unit load design alternative. And that's what we are going to start learning uh, from now on. So once you have all this information, all this data, now the process begins in terms of organizing the information and evaluating the layout options, the material handling, the storage, and the unit load design alternatives. Uh, so there's going to be seven management and planning tools that we are going to use for this process. And these have gained uh, acceptance as a methodology for improving planning and implementation efforts. So I'm just going to present those tools today. We are not going to go in detail. We're going to do that through uh, the rest of the semester. Um, so we start with the affinity diagram that is used to gather verbal data, such as ideas and issues, and organize that into groups. So here we have an example for an affinity diagram for reducing manufacturing lead time. So the time it takes you for getting an order up till you get the final product out of the, the uh, out of the manufacturing plant. So what are the things that they are recommending? There are issues in reducing the manufacturing lead time uh, related to facilities design, equipment issues, quality, setup time, and scheduling. And those are listed, they are organized into groups and they are used to gather initial information about the problems that need to be solved. There is another tool, this is called the interrelationship diagram. It's used to map the logical links among related items, trying to identify which items impact others the most. Uh, so here we have an example for an interrelationship diagram for facilities design. So you connect those issues that are impacting others. Uh, in this case, we go from four uh, product families. So meaning that product family could be, uh, for example, if you work for Samsung, you would have the families of cell phones, you have family of tablets, you have other families in your production lines. Um, so forming those families um, and then assigning families to manufacturing cells. So now that you have those different products or do those different families, how do you assign those to your, your production in terms of areas? Um, and then based on that, what, how do you assign the raw materials to the point of use and keep receiving and shipping close to the production? So again, connecting those issues, see how those impact. So in this case, this assignment is going to impact the, the assignment of raw materials and also where you place the receiving and the shipping for the production. Uh, a three diagram, if you took um, probability and statistics, we, they talk about three diagrams also. Um, it's the same idea, instead of using probabilities, we are using um, information. Uh, so the three diagram is used to map in increasing detail the actions that needs to be accomplished in order to achieve the general objective. So we go from um, the formation of family or product family formation into 
the the actions and the details that we need for the process so compound similarities machine use demand for product and machine capabilities and then from there go a step far, uh, forward in terms of detail determine part uses per product identify unique parts per product identify common products uh, that for compound similarities and therefore machines used, determine the machines needed for per product, identify machine sequence per product, and so on. So again, different ways of presenting the information that you will need in order to uh, design your, your facility. Uh, the matrix diagram organizes information such as characteristics, functions, and tasks into sets uh, of items to be compared. So uh, here we have a matrix diagram for team participation. So you have um, the participants at the top. These are different names of employees. And then you have um, the different teams in the production floor. You have a part users team, you have a machine use and cap team, and you have a demand forecast team. And then you have this legend right here that is showing you what are the responsibilities for each one of the uh, members of each uh, group. L for team leader, C for coordinator, and P for, particip for participant. So this gives you an idea of who is in charge uh, of each team and who is uh, committed, let's say, the most for uh, in terms of leaders, leadership positions and time consumption of your, I mean, the time allocated for, for doing certain tasks. Um, so if you look at uh, Joe here, he's a participant for one of the groups and then he's a leader for uh, another group. So making him a leader that has more responsibilities as being a participant, right? So there's a balance here, um, the lead, and then he's a participant of another group. Uh, Mary is just participating in one of them. Same thing for Linda. So there are coordinators. And then you have Jack is just participating in two of the teams. So you, you see the benefits. So you start looking at, okay, who is doing what in each team, who's committed the most, who is uh, putting more time in each one of these teams. And then you can use this information to balance out uh, your participation in allocating uh, responsibilities within the, the facility. Um, maps, the contingency diagram is map conceivable events and contingencies that might occur during implementation. So after you make decisions, you also want to plan for those unexpected situations. And uh, so that's what the contingency diagram is doing. So if you were to roll out a, a, a layout, a new facility is designed, you also want to think about what are the things that can go wrong uh, and plan for those. Like, I, I need this type of machine. I need the machine by next month here. What, what would happen if that machine is not here next month? What is my contingency plan? Uh, so that's the idea. It is particularly useful when the project being planned consists of unfamiliar tasks. So, um, so for example, this is a very uh, simple example, uh, maybe related to some of us. So what are the reasons, what can go wrong that can get you late to, um, to school? Be late to school. Um, these are three things. Ignore the alarm, get clothes dirty, and run car out of gas. So how do you plan for those? So those three things cannot be uh, an issue, and you can get on time, let's say, to your next class. Uh, so that's the idea. So you list those, and then you start planning, OK, what can I do to uh, not ignore my alarm? Can I put two or three alarms at the same time? Or can I place my phone far from me? Uh, and so Clothes dirty, plan for that. Okay, I'm gonna be washing my clothes every two days, three days. In the car, obviously, uh, you wanna make sure that you check for that every uh, certain time. If you're in the industrial engineering program, you might be familiar with this diagram. This is called the activity network diagram. 
And the activity network diagram is used to develop a work schedule for the facilities design effort. Um, the, this diagram is synonymous with the critical path method or CPM graph. So the idea here is that you can plan for, I mean, looking at the lead times, looking at the start of a process, the end of a process, um, the activity duration, the early start, the early finish, the late start, the late finish, you can understand how long is it gonna take you to from beginning to end of a particular activity. Um, so this is useful for planning your and implementing a layout design. Again, talking about uh, knowing when the, the machines are going to arrive, the equipment is going to arrive. Uh, let's say you're gonna install an HVAC system. So when are those going, where is the technical support is gonna go in to install that system? You cannot do something until they're completing that process. So all those things can be mapped here. And that will tell you in, I mean, looking at the, the end, the early start, the early, um, and how long will it take you to complete the, the process? So an, an activity network diagram. And the prioritization matrix um, in developing facilities design alternatives is important to consider the following, uh, the layout characteristics, distances travel, shop floor visibility, aesthetics of the layout, ease of adding future business, material handling requirements, use of current material handling equipment, investment requirements of new equipment, space and people requirements. Uh, for example, a few years ago, I don't know if they already uh, changed that or not, uh, we, we went to the warehouse, HGB warehouse here in San Marcos, and they were planning to make some investments in changing their material handling equipment in the warehouse because they were dealing with these uh, conveyors that were, uh, I will not say old, but they, they have uh, elapsed their, their life. Uh, so there's better equipment out there uh, and to improve the their way that they put in their orders for the other supermarkets. Uh, so. Do you need to invest in that on that or not? For them, that was a, a priority because they were growing really fast by that time. Uh, so they wanted to be more efficient. Uh, unit load imply, impact of working process level, space requirements, impact of material handling equipment, uh, storage strategies, space and people requirements, impact of material handling equipment, and human factor risk, and the overall building impact estimated cost of the alternative and opportunities for new business. Um, so here's an example of how can we implement something uh, like this, the prioritization matrix. So we list all those um, items. We have a, a letter associated to it. And then we have weights that tells you if they're equally important, if there are more important or still more important, um, or if they are significantly less important or extremely less important. So what you're gonna do with this um, matrix is that you're going to compare each one of them, each one of these items at the top from A to K, and you're going to assign a value of one, five, 10, one fifth, or one ten to each uh, combination. So if you go to A, A, B, B, you see that's one. So that's not making an impact because those are the same factors. So that diagonal is gonna be one. But for the rest of them, you're comparing them. Um, so for example, if you look at A, B and A, there's a uh, saying that B is one fifth or significantly less important than A, okay? And then you accumulate those numbers um, to the right and at, at the bottom for each column, at the end of the row for each uh, row, and then you can compute 
uh, the totals and the percentage that represents out of the total for each one of those items. So you see for A, that represents a 9.9%. Um, see which one is the highest one. I is 18.3%. So you can start ranking those items in terms of uh, level of importance and start working from there. And then if you were to apply those um, tools, uh, this is the logical application sequence of the seven management and planning tools. So you will start with the affinity diagram and the interrelationship diagram. And then from there you move to the three diagram. And from there you move to the prioritization matrix and the matrix diagram. And finally, you know, information that is known, you do the activity network diagram, you do unknowns, you do the process design program chart. Um, so I think that's the last slide for this first lecture. Do you have any questions? Okay. You have about 10 minutes. I don't know if we should start a, I will not start a new lecture material. We'll do that on Wednesday. So let's stop here. Uh, we'll start with lecture two on, on Wednesday. Um, Make sure that you submit your lab. I think the assignment is also available so you can start working with that. And if you have questions, I have office hours tomorrow from 8.30 to 10.30. The link is available on the syllabus um, and let me know, okay? So if there's no questions, then I'll see you on Wednesday. So I originally saw lab one just individually like not with the big equations like you did. Is that fine to train? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs>